Welcome and thanks for coming in to our home buying presentation. Everything you need to know before buying a home. You know, as I mentioned, we've had a lot to cover. I am recording this and I'll send it out to everyone. So uh, in case I'll go over something really quickly, you know, you'll have it uh, in video format so you can look over it. So what are the goals for this webinar? So number one, I think the biggest goal is just to get you as a home buyer to start thinking about the important questions that you need to be thinking about before you buy a home, right? There's just a lot to know in terms of real estate. Uh, so we're gonna start to answer some of those questions and a lot of those are personal questions. So you'll have to answer them for yourself. Uh, number two, get a better understanding of the home buying process. Um, that way you, you, know, you know what to expect once you engage and become a, you know, a serious home buyer in the market. And then lastly, after this uh, presentation, I hope that you come out as a smarter home shopper. And what that means to me is you, you've got a better understanding of how things are working. So you're in a stronger position to make good home buying decisions, whether you're you know, a better decision on buying the right house, uh, selecting the right agent, or finding the right lender. Uh, that's really what the goal is for this uh, webinar. A little bit about me. I've been a licensed real estate agent for 20 years. I've sold a lot of homes. I, to be honest with you, I don't know how many, and I don't know if that's really that important. I've built two homes, or I've been involved in the development and building of two homes. I've worked on hundreds of remodeling projects. I've managed rental properties. And through it all, I've had hundreds of real estate related headaches, and I'm still learning. All right. Uh, let's see here. So these are the questions that we're going to be going over this hour. So that you can see there's quite a lot that we're going to be going over. And uh, I'm, I'm not going to go over it right here, of course. Each one of these has their own slides. So let's go ahead and jump right in. So the first question is probably the most important question that we're going to be asking ourselves. Uh, and this is going to be a very personal question. So why am I buying a home? Well, there's a lot of reasons why people buy homes. Um, you know, they're looking for the stability, they know they're going to be in the area for a long time, and they want to, you know, settle down, uh, they, you know, they're finding a home for their family. Um, but in some cases, one of the primary motivations for some buyers might be that, you know, they're looking at buying real estate in terms of wealth building or as a good investment. Now, there's really no perfect reason for buying a home. These are all very good reasons. But if your primary reason for buying a home is wealth building or as a good investment, and that typically will happen if you're a single individual or maybe you're a young couple starting out and you want to get into the housing market, you know, my advice to someone like that is because of your reasons are primarily financial, that you really want to ask yourself this question and make sure that you're, you're grounded in your life. In other words, that you're really going to be in this area. Uh, for a good amount of time, right? What I've seen in the past, people have contacted me about selling their home. Uh, maybe they, they bought it with another agent and they've only owned their home maybe for one, two, maybe three years. And maybe they bought at a high time when the, the market was really crazy and that kind of motivated their reason for buying. And then they go to sell their home and they find out that they're really not making that much money on their home or they might even make a loss, right? Because we all know buying a home in uh, the Silicon Valley or in our local Bay Area market can be expensive, but what also is really expensive is selling a home. So make sure the reason if you're buying a home, if it has to do with financial uh, motivations, you'll wanna make sure that you're gonna be committed to staying in that home for around five years. That's not a hard five years, but it's kind of the number that I, you know, I think is stable, right? You know, there could be times when that five years doesn't matter as much, but that's a, a little bit of a red flag, right? If you get to that point, you're like, hey, I am buying this because I think it's going to be a good investment. There's a little bit further thought that you need to make just to make sure that at the end of the day, it turns out to be a good investment, all right? Now, is now a good time to buy a home in the Bay Area? Right. So this question, I don't really like it the way it's phrased. Uh, if you ask this question to any real estate agent, chances are they're always going to say it's a great time to buy a home in the Bay Area. But specifically, I think this question is better if, if it's phrased. Is it a good time for me to buy a home in the Bay Area? 
right? And part of that is the, the reason that we were talking about before, what is your motivation? Now, generally buying a home in the Bay Area can be really challenging. Typically our markets are you know, somewhat volatile. Either they're really going up or they're going up uh, or maybe you know, they, there's a sharp pullback because of some uncertainty in the market. And that could have been either COVID or what we're experiencing now, right? Interest rates are high, potential um, you know, recession looming in the future and of course uh, potential job losses that may affect you, right? So the, the Bay Area real estate market is never one that's you know, kind of just there and prices are fairly stable. Typically they're going up, but sometimes they do go down. And when they do go down, they can go down rather sharply. So understanding the Bay Area market is really important uh, to make sure that you don't get caught in one of those situations where you bought and prices come down. Or if it is, again, a, your primary reason is to buy for financial reasons, that you know, it's gonna be a good decision uh, to buy at this time, right? So in our current market, there's a lot going on. We're in one of these rare situations where real estate has slowed down, the market did correct, uh, and now we're in this phase of, you know, the market's actually doing quite well right now because there's not a lot of homes for sale, so prices are not dropping, but there's still quite a bit of uncertainty going on. We don't know what's going to happen exactly to rates, and we're not sure about where prices will be in the next six months. So again, this is one of those periods where you've got to kind of talk to your agent and understand, you know, what the advantages and disadvantages of buying in this market will look like. The other important thing to realize is the seasonality of the market. So our markets are very seasonal. And what, what is affected by the season is the amount of homes for sale, right? So we're at the beginning of the year. We just got a, out of the holiday season. And we're typically starting out with very low inventory at the beginning of the year. And as we move into spring and as we move into summer, that inventory increases. And generally, we see our highest levels of inventory in those summer months and sometimes the early fall months. But typically, by the time you're getting into fall and you're getting back into the holiday season again, um, that's when inventory starts to drop down. And of course, once we get into the holidays, we reach the lowest levels of inventory. So if you are a home buyer, you typically want to be in the market when there are a lot of homes, right? So summer seems like a logical time to be looking for homes because there's a lot more supply at that time. Well, it's not always the best time to look in terms of the summer because sometimes at the beginning of the year, like we're seeing now where there's not a lot of homes, uh, prices do get bid up and we see quite a lot of appreciation at the beginning of the year. So if you wait until summer, sure, there'll be more homes on the market, but those homes could be more expensive, right? So that's just one thing to understand about our market, uh, that there is no perfect time to buy, but if you understand the market and you're working with a real estate agent, that really pays attention to these things, they can kind of explain, you know, what's going on in this specific cycle that we're having, right? All right, so the home buying process. So you'll see here, I've broken it down to eight steps. This is not a Bible. Some people might have it down to five steps. Some people might have it down to more. We'll go uh, over these individually and there is no specific order as to how these steps need to be done. Everyone does it differently. Uh, but I do think this is kind of a smart way to go about it. So number one, financing. This is one of the most important factors of buying a home because A, it's important to know what it's going to cost. And a lot of that has to do how you're going to be financing it. So the first thing about financing is you'll probably hear is pre-approvals, right? And these are extremely important if you're going to be a serious home buyer in our market because pre-approvals typically talk about the strength of the buyer. And every seller is going to expect to see a pre-approval from a buyer, right? And we have different levels of pre-approval. You might hear pre-qualification being thrown out there. And that's typically a situation where you go to your bank, you talk to maybe a lender there, and you just give them or you tell them, you know, how much money you make, what your debt is, and what your credit score is. But they don't really verify that. But they can get that information and they can throw out some numbers and you are pre-qualified. But in reality, it's not a very strong pre-approval and it's not one that the seller is going to be very, or seller or agent is going to be very, you know, um, confident in, right? So the next level is an actual pre-approval where they get the physical W-2 statements, your tax returns, they run your credit and they verify that that stuff is all correct and then they give you an actual pre-approval. Now, this may take a day, this may take a couple days, uh, but these banks or these lenders 
uh, we'll submit that information and then they'll have a formal pre-approval letter that they give you. And at that point, you're formally pre-approved and you're ready to start buying or ready to start making offers. There is another level of pre-approval and this is referred to as underwritten pre-approval where you go through that pre-approval stage, but there's an, an additional stage where they take that information that you provided them, they give it to another person, which is a, outside of your lender or outside of your loan officer who is the underwriter. It is their job to go line by line through your file and see if there's any sort of inconsistencies or any problems that need to be clarified. And through that process, there'll be some conditions that need to be met. But if once you get through that underwritten pre-approval process, it means that your loan has been thoroughly vetted and that you're a stronger, there's a stronger chance that you're going to be able to get that loan much stronger, almost, I hate to say 100%, but pretty much 100% confidence that you're going to be able to get that loan, right? There's lots of different types of lenders that are doing loans these days. Of course, there's the big banks, B of A, Wells Fargo, Citibank, Chase. You probably have an account with these banks right now. They have mortgage arms and they definitely want to originate mortgages. So these are usually institutions that, that when we see a pre-approval from them, we tend to trust them, right? So I definitely recommend if you're going to go out there and get a pre-approval, use one of these big banks because they're well-trusted. Uh, they typically, the advantage of, of these big banks is because they're the direct lenders and they're originating these loans, the cost of these loans typically are gonna be a little bit cheaper than say, if you went through a mortgage broker because it's directly through them, right? So that's kind of the advantage. If you have a bank account with them, some of them offer relationship pricing. That's the case for Wells. I think uh, uh, Chase might do that as well. So if you have a certain amount of money in accounts with them, they will lower the rate of your loan. So there's some advantages there. And the next step is credit unions. In the recent years, we've seen credit unions assume a larger take in the mortgage world. Uh, there's a couple of big credit unions out there that are doing quite a good uh, business with loans. They've got some very competitive rates out there as well. And of course, they're also direct lenders. So they're similar to these big banks, but of course, they're much smaller players. They're more regional and not as national. Right. And then lastly, uh, there are mortgage brokers. These are smaller groups that work with these other lenders. They work at the wholesale uh, level. So they'll go to these different lenders and they'll see what these lenders are offering in terms of rates that day. And they can you know, connect you with the right lender for that time. Now, mortgage brokers, basically there's more flexibility there because they're looking at all the different loans that are available. You're not just having to get a loan through B of A. You can get a loan through any one of these other arms, but the downsides there, are, I think, are they're typically going to be more expensive because the mortgage broker is going to be the middleman there. He's going to need to get paid. So the loans are going to be a little bit more expensive in terms of cost. And then lastly, they don't have access to an underwriter since they're not part of that organization. So you can't get an underwritten pre-approval from a mortgage broker. So I don't recommend you getting pre-approved through a mortgage broker. Lastly, there's investment brokerages. You might have an account with Morgan Stanley. You might have an account with um, you know, one of these other large investment brokerages. They are also originating uh, loans, and sometimes they have some very good rates as well. Right? Loan costs, I'm not going to go into the specifics of loan costs on this slide, but understand that these are really important. When you talk to lenders, you want to get an estimate of what they're charging you. Right? So you want to get a breakdown of that. And as far as loans are concerned, there's typically two different types. Uh, there's a, you know, what's called like a fixed rate mortgage where the rate of that mortgage is going to be fixed throughout the period of that loan. And then there's these adjustable rate mortgages, right? So they're fixed for a certain part. And then after that, they will float to the prevailing rate. We see them as three-year fixes, five-year fixes, seven and 10-year fixes. And the advantages of these adjustable rate mortgages are because they're a little bit riskier, you can get lower rates through these, uh, these uh, types of loans. And it's typically what a lot of people are using right now to get more competitive rates because the rates are higher. And the assumption there is that interest rates will be dropping maybe even later this year, but in the next coming years. So, you know, you'll be able to refinance once rates are a little bit more attractive, right? So that's the advantage of using an adjustable rate mortgage as opposed to getting a fixed mortgage. And as far as what is an APR is concerned, so it's an annual percentage rate. You might see that in loan statements. And the importance behind that is once you get quoted various different loans from different, different banks and different organizations, you know, you can see some loans with better rates, others have higher costs. 
the APR kind of evens all that up. It assumes the costs and the rate together and it basically gives you a number where you can compare them. So if the APR is significantly different than the interest rate that you're getting, you know that there's a lot of costs associated with that loan. All right, step two, hiring and working with an agent. Again, there's no order to this. Sometimes people get pre-approved and they don't get an agent until much later. Um, you know, sometimes they start already home shopping and they don't have an agent and they don't even have a pre-approval. But you know, this is a good time to start developing a relationship with an agent. So what do agents do? So the importance of an agent is they show you homes, right? They have access to opening up the homes and getting you inside those homes. But a good agent's gonna go just beyond just showing you homes. They're gonna point out the pros and cons of the homes. Uh, they may even be able to help you finance, uh, not help you finance, but help you find financing, right? They're working with a lot of different lenders. They're seeing what their clients are using and what rates they're getting. So they be, would be able to suggest maybe some competitive lenders out there that you could use to get a better rate. And they navigate the process. So the process that we're going through right now or we're describing, they'll go into depth about what's going on, what to expect. So it really helps you feel at ease that everything is gonna be all right. Uh, they also help you make sense of inspection reports. So when you start to identify homes and you're interested in homes, you're gonna get these inspection reports and you may not understand what these things are, mean and how severe they are. You know, as a good agent who has a lot of experience, may even have a little bit of a background in terms of construction, uh, might be able to explain the severity of these problems, have you understand if these are big or not so big or typical problems, and that therefore help you avoid making any mistakes. And also, another important factor for agents is they should understand the market, right? They should understand what's going on and be able to convey that to you so you know what to expect, right? Ultimately, a really good agent is gonna protect you and help you avoid making any mistakes, right? And that's the biggest thing in terms of real estate. And one of the things that you're probably concerned with, you know, being such a huge financial commitment, buying a house is you don't wanna make a mistake. Step three, identify your needs. So this could be step one, right? Um, so step three, after you've been pre-approved, you might have a good idea of what kind of budget you want to put in for a home. That could vary, right? But then, of course, you want to identify what type of home that you're going to be buying. Is it going to be a town, a condo, single family home? And then, of course, area and areas, right? Maybe you're really specific. Hey, I want to find a home in this area because this is where I live now and it's close to work, or this is where I want my kids to be going to school. Or maybe you're more specific about the type of home that you need and you're more flexible on the area. Maybe you're willing to live in you know, a couple of different cities as long as you can find this type of home and these other factors, right? So a good agent will help you identify maybe some other areas that can make sense to you that you're not familiar with, right? But at this point, you really wanna start talking about what are the important things that you need for your home, right? Step four, the home search. Sometimes again, this could be step one. So how do you find homes? You're probably already familiar with some of these websites, Zillow, Redfin, Realtor.com, and there's dozens of these um, website or these property portal sites that you see out here. These are the most popular, but there's some differences here, and I'll explain, uh, you know, what these, why these sites exist. So Zillow and Realtor.com, these are lead aggregation sites, and basically their model is they're out there to attract uh, home buyers to register on their site. And when you're on your, their site, you'll see properties and you might be interested in those properties and you might indicate that you wanna see that property. Well, these two companies, Zillow and Realtor.com will put you in touch with an agent and that is an agent that is paying them directly or they have some sort of agreement that uh, they will be paid once that agent finds a house for that client. So Zillow and Realtor.com, they work in connecting realtors and buyers together and the motivation for them is to be paid after the deal closes from that agent, right? Or being paid up front from that agent. Redfin is a brokerage, right? Similar to the brokerage I work for, Keller Williams, it has agents that work directly for Redfin. So when you're on Redfin and you wanna see a house and you indicate it to them, hey, I wanna see this house, they're gonna put you in touch with one of their agents to show you that house, right? So that's how their business models work. Now there's also agent sites. I have an agent site as well. 
Um, but to be honest with you, if I had to tell you what the best site in terms of information that's out there for home searchers, I would tell you it's the Redfin site. I think I have one of the better agent sites that are out there in terms of information, but still I think Redfin has a lot more information out there in terms of all the stuff that it provides, right? So there's also MLS listings. Now MLS listings is the client facing portal for our MLS. Now an MLS is a company uh, out there and basically that company is like a tech company and it basically has all the listings in that area. So there are there is a big realtor association in the Bay Area that all the realtors belong to and they share all their listings. And MLS listings is the company that manages that. So they provide the software and the access to that, that information. And their website is mlslistings.com. So again, that's another place where you can search uh, listings. However, is it as good as Redfin? I personally don't think so. Another place that you can look for listings is off-market listings. Sometimes you'll find those on Craigslist. Agents have access to off-market listings as well through colleagues from their office or just their network of other agents. Also, of course, there's open houses. And of course, you can also look at uh, properties with your agent when they're showing you homes, right? So these are all the different ways that you can find and search for homes. Step five, understanding properties. So this isn't really a step. This is kind of like uh, something that happens as you're working with your agent and you're looking at more and more properties in the marketplace. So this is a really important step, however, and this is why I included it because, you know, you, know, you may not be familiar with homes because, you know, you're a first time home buyer, you've never owned a home, you may have lived at home, but you never really paid attention to them. So there's a lot of factors that you need to consider when you're looking for a home and you want to make a really good decision on your purchase, right? Things like floor plan, location and area, um, you know, the age and, and characteristics of the home. These are all really important things to consider and understand their implications um, and, you know, what can mean down the road for you. So floor plan, for example, this will dictate how you live in the home. So it's a critical factor of the home, especially if you want to enjoy living there, right? And it's also something that can be very expensive or difficult to change, right? Location and area, well, you can't really change those things. So that also is another important thing. And also it could affect resale as well, right? Type of property, single family home, condo and townhome. And we'll go into what uh, the differences are and what condo and townhomes are and HOAs are a little bit later. But you know, obviously these are different types of property and there's advantages and disadvantages. And of course, age and characteristics. Well, what does that mean? Things like slab foundations as opposed to raised foundations. Things, you know, houses that don't have attic cavities that just have um, you know, decking for roofing, right? What are the advantages and disadvantages of these homes? Uh, sometimes it boils down to how easy can I add a central heating system or is that even possible, right? Uh, so understanding the drawbacks and positives to these types of construction, what it means to you in terms of, you know, changes later on that you want to make. These are all important things that you'll want to think about uh, before you buy a home. And then lastly, condition of the home, you know, the inspections and reports that you're going to receive, uh, you're looking through to understand, you know, how much some of the stuff is going to cost. Is it really important? You know, the foundation issues that maybe a home is confronting. Uh, you know, how severe are they? Are these very typical? You know, what do I need to know here? These are all important things that uh, an agent can go over with you or at least put you in touch with the important people to answer your questions. Making an offer. So after you've gone through step, steps one through five, you're in a position to, you know, start making offers on homes because you've got some good background in terms of the homes and you're pre-approved. So, you know, you're out there, you, you probably maybe have already identified a home that you're interested in, right? So what do you need to do to make an offer? Well, you need a pre-approval, preferably an underwritten pre-approval from a large bank, right? Proof of funds, which are basically just recent bank statements showing where your down payment is being held. So is it in a bank account? Is it a 401k? Is it held in stock? Uh, the sellers are going to expect to see that. The agent or the listing agent is going to expect to see that. And then, of course, the offer or the contract or the purchase agreement. These are all the same things. This is what your agent's going to help you draft 
that's going to stipulate all the things that you are offering and expecting out of the agreement. And inside of that agreement is going to be the, the deposit, the EMD, as we call it, the earnest money deposit, which is typically 3% of the price that you're offering. So if it's a million dollars, that's going to be $30,000. And that is expected to be wired into the escrow company within one day of your offer being accepted. Okay. And then will there be any contingencies in that offer? So the way I describe a contingency is a contingency is a period of time that you're indicating to the seller that you need to do your due diligence, whether you need to investigate the property of the home a little bit more, maybe you need to bring in someone to, to analyze it, maybe you want to just check out you know, what the neighborhood's like or talk to some neighbors and find out if this property is it has any other issues that you're not aware of, right? Uh, also, there is a financing contingency. This is a contingency that you would want to keep if you're not sure about your loan or there's something a little bit iffy, right? And then lastly, an appraisal contingency. And basically that contingency exists because, you know, the offer that you're making, you want to make sure that the, the value of the home or at least the appraisal of the home is consistent with that amount, right? If you make an offer and after you get the appraisal done and you have to get an appraisal done if you're getting a loan because the lender is going to rely on that appraisal to base the amount of money that they're going to lend you. If there is a big difference there in terms of the price that you've offered and the appraisal price, well, the lender is going to base their loan on the appraisal price. So that difference you'll have to make up in terms of bringing more cash to the table. So if you're, you know, at your point in terms of down payment, you can only do a 20% or a 10% down payment, and there's an appraisal discrepancy then that could put a lot of uh, stress or issues on your deal. Now, typically in our market, because it tends to be so competitive, it's not uncommon. It's in, in fact, it's very common that when people are making offers, they're making non-contingent offers. So they're waiving these contingencies. And the way that they do that is they, they are hedging their mistakes. In other words, so they're getting an underwritten pre-approval, they're going through all the uh, paperwork, all the inspections, and, and really analyzing it and making sure that there's nothing uh, in there that's going to be a deal killer. And of course, in terms of appraisal, they're doing what they can to figure out what they think the home is going to appraise for. And if there's any sort of discrepancy that they anticipate, they're prepared to bring in that additional money as down payment money. Okay. Step seven, escrow. So escrow is something that you're going to open uh, if your offer gets accepted. So after you submit your offer, you typically will hear within 24 hours of the response, but generally it's sooner than that, right? Sooner, you know, within a few hours, if you're one of the top offers, your agent's going to be getting a call from the other agent and there might be some negotiation happening at that point. But basically the responses are either they're going to accept your offer, they will reject your offer, or they will counter your offer. And they may even do what's called a multiple counter where they're countering multiple different parties, right? So at some point, once you get through that, and if you end up being the offer that's accepted, you're going to be opening up escrow, and you'll have to wire your money into the escrow company. Now, escrow title company, you'll hear those, those names being thrown out about uh, a lot. They're pretty much synonymous in our market. They're the same company. The same company is serving both functions of title and escrow. Right. So what the escrow company does is they're a third party company that's facilitating the close or this transaction. They want to make sure that all the money is in title or in escrow before the deal closes. And they want to make sure that once that money is there and everyone's in agreement that you will get you, the buyer, are going to get clear title to the property. So in order to do that, they're doing a lot of work in the background to make sure that the title is clear, to make sure all the paperwork is clear so everything gets recorded and there's no issues that come up in a year or two uh, after you buy the property, right? So they're gonna be working with the buyer and seller, making sure all the paperwork is signed uh, and making sure that the transaction is complete and there won't be any issues. Escrow typically in our market is about 30 days or less. And that really depends on your lender's ability to get the loan out to escrow. So, you know, that could be as short as maybe two to three weeks, but typically we see it around three weeks to four weeks 
uh, in terms of uh, expectations for times for escrow. All right, post escrow. So this is the last step. Some people may not talk about post escrow much, but I also mentioned the walkthrough because it, it actually happens before you close escrow. It's, it's, that, it's an important little detail that you need to do before you close escrow. And essentially the importance of the walkthrough is that before you close escrow, maybe two or three days before, you'll go into the house. Hopefully the house at that point will be vacant. And at, at that point, you'll be able to assess the condition of the house. And it should be in the condition that you expected, the condition that you, uh, you know, when you bought it in. So in other words, if the house was staged and once they took the furniture out, if you started to see a lot of damage in areas, maybe that the staging was covering up, then I would be surprised. And of course I would have my agent bring this up with the other agent. And this is your period of time to just make sure that the condition of the property is in the condition that you expect it to be. And if it isn't, well, this is when you would have a recourse to bring it up and get it rectified. Because after it closes, that's going to be really hard to do, right? But after you close escrow, well, you're going to be busy doing a couple things. You might need to be planning a fumigation or a termite treatment, right? Uh, your agent will help you maybe find or identify some companies that can do that for you with lower costs that are reputable. You might be interested in doing some repairs or updates to that home, right? Some painting, maybe adding some flooring or some remodeling. Again, your agent can help you coordinate that as well in terms of finding a good contractor and helping you get that done. But then also you will wanna understand your new home. You wanna have someone go over that home and show you where the water and gas shutoffs are, how the sprinkler system works, You know what, what's on the various different stations, um, your water softener, if you have a water softener, how that works, how to change air filters, how to control the, you know, the water heater temperature, the, the central heating and cooling temperature. And, and of course, you know, how does your electrical panel work? Where is it? You know, uh, what happens when a, a, a circuit gets tripped? How do I reset that? You know, uh, GFCI plugs, all those things that you may not be familiar with, but as a homeowner, you need to know. It's nice to have someone go over those details with you. And then lastly, you want to start scheduling your move, right? And your agent could help you identify some good movers in the area as well. Now, how much does all this cost, right? So, you know, we'll talk about how agents get compensated a little bit later, but here's what, what to expect. So closing costs typically are going to consist of lender costs, and that's going to be underwriting, processing, appraisal. You know, I've got them all listed here and expect to pay around maybe 5000 it's going to vary by lender, right? And some lenders are going to offer credits for some of these costs as well. It all boils down to the APR. You know, uh, lenders that offer credits may have higher uh, interest rates and then vice versa, right? And then escrow fees, those usually will title around $1,000. And then you'll see here real estate agent fees. Well, the reason why real estate agent fees are zero is real estate agents get compensated by the seller. There's a there's a commission associated with every property. And typically that commission is going to be around two and a half percent. So if the agent represents you on the purchase of a home, that's the commission that they earn or their office earns and they get a portion of that. So that's how a real estate agent is compensated. There are some cases where if it's an off market property and there is no commission associated with that, there might be some agreement that you enter in with your agent about how the agent will be compensated. But for the most part, if the property is located on the MLS or if it's a new construction home being offered by a builder, for instance, then um, you know, they will be compensated either through the MLS or through the builder. Another thing to be aware of is city transfer tax. Every property in the county has a county transfer tax, but that's exclusively paid for by the seller. The city transfer tax in Santa Clara County is typically split between buyer and seller. But there's only three cities in Santa Clara County that have a county tra uh, city transfer tax. That's San Jose, Mountain View, and Palo Alto. So if you buy in those areas, understand there's an additional cost there. It's about $1.65 per thousand dollars of purchase price, right? And it only pertains to those three cities. So how long does this process take? Well, the reality is there's no timetable. I mean, no one can really answer that question. It really depends on you, depends on the market, depends on the type of home you're looking for and how prevalent that home is. I mean, I've had clients that it takes weeks, 
months or even years to find the right home. So, you know, I don't know that you need to have a time frame in mind. Uh, of course, everyone has a time frame in terms of buying a home, um, but just understand that's why it's important to understand the market and what factors are out there. And if your agent's been there long enough, they might be able to give you an idea of what to expect. How do I choose an agent? Well, how do people typically choose an agent? Well, they get a referral from their friend or colleague. They might go online to a review site and they might read reviews about agents. Uh, they meet agents at open houses. Uh, you know, various agents have incentives or rebates that they offer to attract clients to work with them. There's a myriad of different ways of why you would choose an agent, right? As far as what I think is important, the three things, and these probably are pretty obvious, but I would just make sure that the agent that you're working with, number one, knows what they're doing. So they've got to have some level of experience in working with uh, clients and being able to sell homes in terms of working in this area and understanding the market. Uh, they've got to care about you, right? And this is, you know, this is something that's um, kind of strange because an agent gets compensated when they close a deal, right? So if they represent you on a sale and it only took you a week to find this home, uh, for that agent, he's getting compensated quite quickly. Uh, the, you know, the converse is true. If he took a year and he's been working with you a year, well, he finally gets compensated in a year. Obviously, most agents are going to prefer to be paid sooner rather than later. So, you know, there's always a concern about agents are kind of rushing their clients, maybe making them make decisions that they don't feel comfortable about. But at the end of the day, you just want to make sure that the agent that you're working with is listening to you, really paying attention to your needs and understands, and, and obviously going along with what you, he can make suggestions or say, she can make suggestions, but he's going to let you make the decision, right? And then lastly, you feel you can trust them. I mean, I, I think that comes with time. As you're working with an agent, you know, you never know what to expect. Um, but the more you work with that agent, I think you'll have a better understanding if that agent is the right agent for you. How do you choose a lender? Now, lenders are a little bit different because lenders aren't working with you directly or so closely looking at homes and understanding what's going on with these homes in the different areas, right? Uh, and they're not really the ones that are, you know, motivating you or telling you that, you know, hey, you need to buy a home. You know, lenders are there like you go to them when you need them, right? So basically, again, recommendations from friends, your bank or credit union. You can shop around in various different places uh, to find the best rates, right? And of course, there's agent recommendations, right? So basically, you're going to look at, you know, the rates that these lenders are going to uh, offer you. Uh, and of course, what are the charges? But most importantly, these lenders have to make sure that they can close on time. If you're going through the internet and trying to find an internet lender that's based out of a different state, uh, they may not understand the timeframes that we work with in our area, which tend to be really tight in other states. It's typical to close a loan in 45 or 60 days. And that's just a lot longer than what we do here in the Bay Area, right? All right, so what should I be looking for when I'm, I'm searching for a home? Well, this gets back to the, the, you know, the first question of why you're buying a home, right? But to me, the biggest things that I put a lot of weight on are the location of that home and the floor plan, because these are the, the two things that either you cannot change or are really expensive to change, right? Condition is something that you can change. It can be expensive to alter, but ultimately if the location and the floor plan are, are good, it usually means that you're in a good spot, like it's a good decision, right? So I always put a lot of stress on my clients, you know, a good location and a solid floor plan and the rest you can, you know, you can uh, arrange over time or get done. Where should I buy a home in the Bay Area? So again, location, 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 you hear that a lot. It's really important. Um, but I'm not going to give you specifics on where you need to buy a home in the Bay Area, uh, because that will depend on where you work and you know, where you want to reside. But just understand that not every location is the same, obviously. Um, you know, busy streets, maybe backing up into commercial strip centers or something about a particular location that might be a little bit off. Sometimes it's directions. Maybe it's a T intersection. All these little things can affect not only maybe the, the enjoyment of the home, but also the resell of a home. 
and also cities, neighborhoods, infrastructure. You know, these are all benefits and trade-offs and risks, uh, right? So buying a home, say, in a big city like San Jose is a lot different than, say, buying a home in Campbell or Los Gatos or something like that. These, every city is run differently. Every city has, um, you know, different problems, right? So just understanding that, you know, if you're buying a home in a city, well, that city could impact uh, your enjoyment of that home and ultimately maybe even the resale of that home. So what are the costs of owning a home? We're gonna talk about property taxes, HOA costs, insurance costs, maintenance, you know, updates. And we're just gonna go over general, obviously, because we don't have a specific uh, home in mind, but let's talk about property taxes. So roughly, what do you expect to pay in property taxes? We usually estimate about one and a quarter percent of the price of your home, and that is paid yearly. Now we pay property taxes twice a year. So you pay half of it, it's due on December 10th, and then the other half is gonna be due on April 10th, right? So if you don't pay your property taxes in time, in other words, if you pay on the 11th, there's a 10% penalty, right? So you wanna make sure that you pay those in on time. Now, technically your property taxes are calculated by the rate of 1.199%. So it's about 1.2. The other half a percent uh, is made up of assessments. So every home is in a, you know, an area and there are assessments that are assessed by the county. Uh, these are for flood control projects, maybe mosquito control projects. In your particular district, you might have a bond measure for a library or the community college or whatever. But all these assessments are going to be on your tax bill and they get voted on during the, uh, the election year, right? So if you want to know specifically what your property taxes will be, well, you, there's a disclosure that when you're looking at a property that will let you compute your property taxes based on the price that you're offering. So if you're offering a million dollars, you multiply it by 1.19, you add all the assessments and you'll know specifically what your yearly property tax bill will look like. And it goes up 2% per year if there's an increase in value. That is the cap. So it can't go any higher than 2% per year, which generally in our area isn't a problem because real estate usually appreciates more. But if it happens, your property value happens to drop in a given year, like it has last year for some home buyers, well, you can file an appeal and the county will look at it and they'll reassess your property, not reassess your property, but look at the current value based on the current market and adjust your property taxes, right? Another thing you have to be aware of is supplemental taxes. So when you buy the property that you're buying, when you close escrow, you're gonna be paying the property taxes of the previous owner, right? Your new property tax bill will not come into, into form until another six to eight months later until the, the county is able to catch up and factor what your property tax is. So at some point, six to eight months later, you're gonna get what's called a supplemental property tax bill, which is gonna catch you up to where you need to be. And then from there, you're gonna be paying what the property taxes will be for your home. HOA, so this is another thing that can vary. Uh, you can pay as low as you know, $75 on some HOAs. These are typically HOAs that manage single family homes. But typically, if you're buying a condo or a townhome, these HOAs can vary anywhere from $300 to $600 or more, right? What do these HOA cover? Uh, well, they cover insurance on the home. Um, these are just like the overall blanket umbrella policies of the insurance. You'll have to have a separate insurance policy for the, uh, policy for the inside of your contents, for instance. Uh, they cover the common area maintenance. Also, they might even cover the exterior of the property. So like the painting, the siding, the roof. And of course they cover reserves. So there's a bank account uh, that they are constantly putting money in to eventually be able to do the capital improvements such as maybe replace roofs, do painting, repair roads, things of that nature. And then lastly, they're gonna cover a management fee for the management company that, that's basically managing the project, right? So. Why, is, why can they vary so much between $300 to $600? Well, I'll tell you that uh, from my experience, it really can break down to the age of the property. Older properties typically tend to be more expensive and there could be a lot of reasons for that. Just maybe the way they were designed, maybe they have wood siding, maybe there's a lot more common areas to maintain. 
Um, and then also, if it's a condo project, uh, a multi-level condo project that has elevators, well, those elevators are really expensive to service and maintain. And if it's a very old project that has elevators, you know, they're always worried about those elevators breaking and being replaced. So in a lot of times, those tend to be very expensive as well, right? So understand that the cost of the HOA goes into maintaining that property. The older the property, more likely the more expensive the HOA. And also if there was a situation where the HOA wasn't con collecting enough money, like they wanted to keep the HOA fees very low for some reason, and they didn't put enough money into the reserves, well, they may have to play catch up later and they might have to start increasing the HOA more substantially in the future, right? Insurance costs. So this again is gonna vary depending on the size of the home and the condition, I should say location of the home, right? Uh, so a single family home expect to pay around $1,500 a year. That's gonna vary on your deductible and the type of coverage that you're, you're gonna have on the home, but typically expect to pay about $1,500 a year. An H06 policy is for a condo, and that's going to cover the interior, the contents of the interior. That's going to be roughly $60 to $80, maybe a month, right? Uh, your HOA is going to pay for the hazard policy, which will cover fire. Flood insurance, that's a separate type of coverage. Uh, your HOA may have it for the, the complex, but if you buy a home in a flood zone, your lender is going to require that you carry flood insurance for that home. Flood insurance can be really expensive. Uh, it can be as high as 2,500 or more, depending on the home, depending upon the severity of the flood zone. Uh, I would recommend that if you're considering a home that's in a flood zone, see if the owner has an elevation certificate. If not, you know, try to get a good quote for what they're paying. And once you buy that home, arrange to have an elevation certificate. So you'll be able to uh, give that to your, your lender and determine what your, your true cost for, for flood insurance would be. And also earthquake insurance. Again, um, if your home happens to be maybe in the hill near a fault line, you're going to be more susceptible to earthquakes. And of course, earthquakes uh, or earthquake insurance is really expensive and it will vary on the type of the home, the age of the home as well, because older homes typically may not be built as well for earthquakes. Uh, they might need to be retrofitted. Uh, so understand if you want earthquake insurance and if it's an older home, that could be really expensive. Now maintenance for a home, so general maintenance costs. Maybe $100 for landscaping to have someone come in, cut your lawn, trim your bushes, and tidy up your yard on a monthly basis. Expect to pay $80 to $100 a month for garbage collection. Uh, water to be maybe $100 to $200 or more. That depends on your landscaping and how often you're watering, and also depends on where you live. I used to live in, uh, I used to live in Mountain View. The source of water there was Hetch Hetchy, and that was very expensive water. Um, you know, if you live in Santa Clara or somewhere where the source of water tends to be groundwater, it typically is much cheaper, but you might need like a, you know, water softener system because that water tends to be very hard. But anyway, just understand water could vary depending upon obviously your use and where you live. Uh, electricity and gas, the major provider in our area is PG&E. Uh, so depending again on its size and usage, 150 to $350 per month. And that'll vary depending on the time of the year. If it's the summer, you're going to be spending a lot of money on electricity because of AC. In the winter, you're going to be spending a lot of money on gas because of heating, right? Uh, you might want to do pest control quarterly to spray for maybe spiders, roaches, and ants. And then you might need to do gutter cleaning yearly just to make sure your gutters are free during the rainy season, like it was this year, right? A lot of rain, a lot of people found out that their gutters were not free of debris. What if you buy a home and there's something that needs to be done, like you need to replace a roof or a furnace? Well, here's what you can expect. A roof replacement, maybe 15 to 20,000. Furnace and AC with new ducts, 20 to 25,000. Uh, you probably want to consider replacing the ducts. So a lot of times those ducts are really old and in bad shape. Copper plumbing, if you want to install that in the house, that's going to be about $10,000. Every toilet, roughly about $400 or could be more, depending on your toilet. Water heater, roughly 2,000. Bathroom remodel, maybe 10 to 15,000. Kitchen remodel, you know, at the very least, maybe 25,000, 50,000 and upwards. Electrical panel upgrade, maybe 5,000. Um, if you want to get an EV charger, you might need to get an electrical panel upgrade in order to have that capacity. But an EV charger usually can be about $1,000. You've got a garage door opener or a new garage door, $1,500. 
dual pane window, $12,000 to $15,000, driveway replacement, 10 to 15K. If you want to do pavers, 20 to 25K. Fences around the property, you know, about 8K. Sometimes you can share that with adjoining landowners if they're willing to pay for it. But if they're not, you're going to be on your own. Landscaping and drainage system. I mean, it just depends. This can be very expensive. It's just going to depend on what you do. If you want to install a new lawn with a sprinkler system, you know, maybe 5K. I mean, there's a lot of things that can go wrong with, uh, you know, uh, homes in terms of repair. Another thing that we didn't talk about is maybe like a sewer line. Uh, a lot of these sewer lines are very old and some of them need to be replaced. Those can be very expensive. You're talking about maybe somewhere around 10 to 15,000 for those. All right, rebuilding. So eventually maybe in the future you're thinking, hey, I want to buy this house and I totally want to rebuild a new house. So what do you expect there? Well, costs of plans and permits can range from 50 to 100K. And that's going to depend on the type of house that you're going to be building. Uh, demolition of your existing house, probably $25,000. And then building anywhere from maybe $300 to $500 per square feet of that property. And then the time frames, well, they can vary. But I think from beginning to end, in terms of planning, you're looking at 12, maybe 18 months, worst case. All right, should you buy a newer home or an older home? Well, I don't think there is a should, uh, newer or older. Uh, because most of the real estate in this area tends to be older, there's not many options for newer homes. There are newer condos and newer townhomes, of course, uh, but you know, those are an entirely different style of home. But there are certain advantages and disadvantages, and that's kind of what I want to talk about here. So newer advantages or newer home, what are the advantages? Well, they typically have better floor plans, typically larger. They're better constructed, right? I mean, the, the materials, the wood may not be as high in terms of quality, uh, of like the old, uh, older homes because they're using old growth wood, but they're better constructed with better techniques and better engineering. They're going to require less maintenance and they've got newer systems, right? Newer heating systems, newer cooling systems. Um, so, you know, newer electrical systems, newer plumbing, uh, plumbing systems. So older home advantages, well, they're more prevalent. You know, there's tons of older homes around the area. Uh, they're generally in better locations, older homes. They're in established neighborhoods. A lot of times newer homes or newer developments are kind of in old industrial or maybe commercial areas, and there's not a lot of supporting infrastructure around them. Um, and then, of course, you know, larger lots typically on some of the older homes, they're more affordable. And again, they're in established neighborhoods, which to me is a big advantage over some of these newer developments. Should you buy a single family home or a condo or a townhome? But to be honest with you, again, there's no way to answer this. This really depends on what you're looking for and what you need. Um, you know, obviously the biggest difference here is a condo and a townhome has condominium ownership, uh, whereas like a single family home doesn't, you own a single family home. So condominium ownership, basically you own like your space and then you have a fractional or a percentage interest or a common interest in all the common areas, right? What you, what basically there's two things that you have to understand about uh, condos and townhomes is that you really don't have as much control. You can't just go out there and start painting your house and doing repairs to it. You've got to ask permission from the uh, homeowners association, right, in order to do that sort of stuff. With a home, you've got more control. You know, for the home, you can expand it. You can do all sorts of things. You know, with a condo and a townhome, you're limited, right? And we'll talk about HOAs a little bit different. What, which is better as an investment? Well, typically, I would say for historically, single family homes have done a lot better just because they're they're rare, right? Uh, you don't see as many single family homes being built now. We do see quite a bit of townhomes and condos being built. And moving forward, that's just going to be the case, right? That just It just makes more sense for developers. Um, but there have been times when the market's gotten really hot and affordability for single family homes has been really high um, or difficult that condos and townhomes their appreciation started to outpace single family homes. But generally when the market corrects, you know, townhome and condos definitely uh, correct more than single family homes. And then lastly, in terms of condos and townhomes, you know, I feel that if you buy a new one, well, it'll be great because it's new, but in 10 years it won't. And then there'll be a new development, maybe right next to it that's newer. So it kind of starts to make your, your property a little bit obsolete or not as attractive. Now, what's an HOA? So, of course, an HOA is made up of homeowners, kind of like yourself, that own properties in, in 
or own a property in the uh, community. And they're the ones that are making the decisions for how the community is going to be maintained, how it's going to be run. They hire the management company, they hire the, the landscapers, and they make decisions on the, you know, the repairs that need to be done, right? So if you live in a, in a community that has an HOA, well, there's upsides and downsides. What are the upsides? Well, the upsides is you don't need to worry about things like landscaping. It just happens. If there's a broken sprinkler, they repair it. You don't need to deal with your landscaper and tell him to fix it. Um, you know, they're on top of it, they're doing it. So it's just a nice hands-off policy or hands-off approach to living. You know, they're making those decisions for you. What's the downside of living in an HOA? Well, they're making those decisions for you. So if they're not making good decisions and they're you know, either spending too much money doing stuff that isn't what you want them to do, or not spending enough and the project's starting to get kind of uh, old and, and start things are starting to get a little bit worn out, then that's not good either. So it really depends on the community that you live in. A lot of times these newer HOAs or these newer developments, they don't require a lot of upfront maintenance. So everything is fine, at least for the next 10, 15 years. But sometimes in these older communities, if decisions weren't made well, there's gonna be a lot of deferred maintenance that needs to be handled and a lot of problems that might come up in the future. So my advice to anyone thinking about buying an older condo or older townhome community, you've got to really scrutinize the HOA docs and really look around that project and figure out what are the issues. Because the last thing you want to do is move into that, uh, that property and find out about all these problems that are having. And you're not happy living there. And then when you go to sell, you know, everyone else that's looking at your property is is a little bit worried about jumping into that situation, right? Wow, we did it in one hour. <laughs> All right, I know I was uh, talking pretty quickly there, um, but the whole goal of this again is just to get you thinking about all the things that are involved in buying a home, especially here in the Bay Area, because it is a unique place to be home shopping, right? So again, I'm gonna record this and send it out to you so you'll have a copy. I intend also on doing individual videos on each one of these topics and going into them in more depth. And I'll be happy to share those with you as well, right? So I feel like now after watching this, you're in a better position to understand what you need to do to take the next step, right? Whether that's get pre-approved or maybe start talking to a lender or, or start engaging with real estate agents and helping you start to identify the home that you're looking for. Now, I'd love to touch base with you. Uh, if you've got any questions specifically about what we went over, if you want to talk about your motivation for buying a home uh, and see what I think and get my input, I'd love to hear from you. And you've got my contact information here. And of course, I will follow up with the email. Uh, but again, I just want to thank you for being in attendance today. And I wish you the best of luck and hope you enjoy the rest of your day. So it's 1031. I've got a few minutes here. I'm happy to answer any questions if you if you have any. If not, I'll just let you go and uh, have a great day. Thanks so much for the presentation. It was a lot of um, useful information. I just have um, one question. Sure. So you mentioned um, about the cost um, associated with, you know, flipping a house. Um, mm -hmm. But would you know, like, the average cost in total? Um, of flipping a house because that's a question I get a lot. I know it varies yeah. depending on what you want to do, but what's the good yeah. part? It, it could vary. I mean, it depends. I mean, if, if flipping a house is different than someone remodeling a house because flippers are always going to look at what the return is going to be, right? So they're always going to be looking at like, hey, I'm going to cut a little corners here. I'm not going to do this um, because it just it doesn't make sense. It's not going to get me any sort of return, right? Um, whereas if, if I was buying it myself and I wanted to remodel it, uh, I'm going to do those things, those extra things, because those are important to me. And those things could be like, hey, I'm going to rewire the entire house or I'm going to add insulation to the house. A flipper typically is not going to rewire the house or add any insulation because he understands that this is not going to add any real value uh, from the buyer. They can't see it. They really won't understand it. Right. So. You know, if I had to average it out, you know, in terms of maybe the, the typical things that a, a flipper would do and a flipper would maybe paint, maybe repair flooring, um, maybe remodel the kitchen and remodel the bathrooms, right? And that's typically what they would do. 
let's say they leave the floor, uh, they leave the, um, the windows intact and they, you know, they might change a few other things, but just those things alone, I would say probably easily a hundred thousand, easily a hundred to 120,000, I would think, right? Um, but the challenge or the downside, I think, with buying a flipped home is, you know, some people do it better than others, but typically what I see from flipped homes is, A, sometimes they don't bother to get permits, right? Because they're just trying to do it really quick, right? And that means that the electrical isn't a code, especially if kitchens were remodeled. That could be a big issue because, you know, you've got this beautiful kitchen, it's already finished. And, uh, and then there's electrical issues. So as you're using it, you know, circuits are popping. You're constantly having to go to the electrical panel and reset them. You can't plug multiple things in. You can't run your dishwasher and then have your toaster on. I mean, it's just annoying things that you would expect to work, but aren't working because it isn't wired properly. And if you want to get it fixed, it's really hard because you've got all this finished stuff like granite cabinetry and tile that you don't want to tear up in order to get to it. So that can be really frustrating. If you're buying a flipped house, you really want to pay attention to those little details uh, because you typically, you know, when you, you go into a flipped house, it looks really nice. You're willing to pay a top premium for it. Um, but if you're not really getting what you think you're getting, that's really frustrating. Right. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, really helpful. Right. Okay. Thanks for asking the question. Hey, uh, yeah, thank you, uh, uh, for your um, for your talk. And uh, uh, this is Jenny. I have a question regarding uh, rebuild. Uh, you mentioned rebuild uh, cost uh, permit from fifty grand to hundred grand, and uh, yeah, the building uh, cost from three hundred to five hundred per square yeah. feet. So that's for um, in Santa Clara County, right? Yeah, I would expect it to be somewhere in line with that. Building in this area is pretty expensive. Um, I would imagine anywhere in the Bay Area, it's going to be pretty similar. If you start to get outside the Bay Area, maybe it could change, like maybe into more rural areas. But there's a lot of regulation in California, especially in the Bay Area. Uh, and then, of course, cost of living here is high. So cost of building yeah. is very expensive. Yeah, so I'm more interested in uh, rebuild uh, in Cupertino area. Mm -hmm. So typically um what is the uh, cost there like yeah that's going to be really high as well and i think one of the other things you have to pay school fees when you do what that fee? yeah there's a way that they tax build people who are building new homes and they yeah. do this in various different communities you'll see it in um the school district gets the money you see it in cupertino you see it in los altos i think you see it in mountain view i think pretty much every city is doing it so if you're building a new house you have to pay these, you know, expensive school fees that mm. total to like, you know, twenty thousand dollars. It's like a way of taxing for building a new house. Yeah, I think they figure like if you're building a bigger house, maybe you have more kids and you've got to pay to update the school because of that. I don't know what the rationale is, but it's it's just another tax is essentially what it is. Okay, so you, this cost is tear down, rebuild from the ground. Yeah, down, rebuild, not a remodel. Yeah, right. not a not like addition? No, no. I mean, additions are definitely much cheaper, but um, yeah, you got it. You know, with additions, from my experience is, you know, if you buy a house that's just a mess, like the way it's designed and you think you're gonna go in there and be able to make it what you wanna make it, uh, after you, you know, after you meet with your contractor and he sees all the work that's involved in trying to transform this house from what it is to where you want it to be, you might see that it's getting really close to, uh, to getting the cost of rebuilding. And it's, it's not gonna be as nice, right? It's not gonna be as good as a rebuild. So that's one of the things you've gotta be careful with when you go out and you select a home and a floor plan, you've gotta be, you know, you've gotta be careful about like, understand what it's gonna take to get that house into the condition that you want it. I was just door knocking yesterday and I saw a house that was completely remodeled and I had seen that house like, you know, a couple of years ago when they bought it before they remodeled it. And I knew that the house was a mess. You know, like the floor plan was a mess and they just put tons of money into it. I didn't ask them how much it costs, but uh, either they remodeled it and the floor plan is still a mess or they spent a lot of money, you know, altering it. But uh, yeah, sometimes remodels can get really expensive. Um, but yeah, they don't, they don't charge you that school fee. Right. 
Mm. So, okay, so typically how long does it take to get a permit? It'll vary depending on the city, but average, uh, yeah. yeah, it'll be like San Jose will be a lot longer than a city like Santa Clara or like any of the smaller cities in the county are going to be, be better response than San Jose. San Jose is taking the longest right now. Uh, so you could look at several months, like six months, or, you know, I don't know specifically if it's gotten mm -hmm. any better, uh, but I've heard, um, you know, I've heard some bad experiences. I would certainly call and check. Yeah, right. that's something I'm really looking to do. I would call and check and make sure yeah. so I know what to expect. All right, thanks. Yep. All right, I do have to get running, um, but thank you for your questions. And um, uh, you know, like I said, I'll get this out to everyone once we have it all recorded. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Bye bye. Bye.